The following program is a UWTV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. and welcome to Upon Reflection, I'm Marcia Alvar. Stuart Stern is considered one of the deans of American screenwriting. His credits include the 1955 James Dean classic Rebel Without a Cause. He also wrote The Ugly American and Sybil, a TV miniseries that won him an Emmy, a Peabody, and a Writers Guild Award. Stuart Stern lives in Seattle where, among other things, he works with aspiring screenwriters in the University of Washington Screenwriting Certificate Program. Welcome to Upon Reflection. Thanks. When you were the age your <coughs> students are now, and you were just starting out in the film business, where could you go for advice on screenwriting? It was hard. If you didn't know a writer, I don't know where you would have gone. They weren't teaching it. Um, you could study playwriting, but there was there were no books. You know now you can go into university bookstore, um, Elliott Bay, and there's a whole section on screenwriting, <clears throat> and all these people have very skillfully gone through the history of screenplays. They've read all the screenplays, and they've kind of extrapolated what they think we did, but nobody knew what they were doing. <laughs> and that's one of the problems because what they have extrapolated and, and uh, formalized in textbooks now has become the way you write screenplays. And a lot of the development people in television down there and also at the major studios where it used to be a producer who had some background as an actor or as a writer himself or herself um, and knew story, uh, the writer would work with them. It was a one-on-one -on -one situation that went on week after week, talking and talking and writing cards and putting things up on bulletin boards and creating a film. And now there are so few people in charge who have that kind of background that they hire a lot of young, very bright people out of film school who have all read these books. So now they confront old Hollywood hacks like me with things like, well, where is your plot point on page 30? Where is the plot point on page 90? Because Sid Field, in his book about screenwriting, said that's where plot points should be. And the question that we usually have is, what's a plot point? I mean, we never heard of it. <laughs> I don't know what a plot point is either. Well, I couldn't tell you myself. It sounds like Hollywood, like everything else, has gotten more specialized. That it's kind of fragmented with different people now being in charge of little bits of productions. Yeah. You, uh, you grew up and you were, you were part of two very important um, early Hollywood families. Was that a help or a hurt? It was both. I mean, it was, it was both. We were raised, we were children when the Lindbergh baby was kidnapped. I was older than he was, but my uncle, who was Adolf Zucker, who created a number of companies that led to Paramount Pictures, <clears throat> was a pioneer and came over as an immigrant boy from Hungary. He had an estate about half an hour out of New York, City. Sort of a Great Gatsby kind of place. Well, his, the Lowe estate was. Marcus Lowe's was Great Gatsby. That's the other family connection. Yeah. But Zucker's was a kind of Tudor English, wonderful place. It was a thousand acres and it had an 18-hole golf course and a hundred-foot swimming pool and a hundred cows in the dairy, <laughs> which is where I spent all my time. And we were raised by governesses. All the parents in those days who could afford to listen to child psychologists, they would go on Monday nights and hear whoever the latest one was. And in those days, kids weren't supposed to be picked up if they cried. 
You weren't supposed to touch them too much. Children who had too much love were called spoiled. So we had these very severe, rather humorless governesses taking care of us, and we saw very little of our parents. And during that time, the Lindbergh baby was taken, and all of a sudden, bars were being put on all the windows in the Zucker. There were three houses. There was a family house, a guest house, which was usually full of people like Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks and Charlie Chaplin on weekends, which was wonderful for us. We didn't really know who they were, but there was this great guy with a mustache who would jump up onto a swing. They had a big swing in the, in the day house, and people would sit on it with great pillows. It was a kind of orgy pad that <laughs> swung from 30-foot chains. And he would go up to the little orchestra balcony, shinny up a chain, and then fling himself from chain to chain doing these great stunts. And we didn't know it was Douglas Fairbanks, but it was this wonderful guy who, who did these amazing stunts. So here you, you grew up sort of steeped in the, the ambience of, of Hollywood. Did it help you when you wanted to, to get a job, start working? I'm going to tell a story with great affection, okay? There was a producer named Henry Ginsburg who was ultimately the producer of Giant, the film that Jimmy Dean did after he did Rebel. <clears throat> and he was the head of Paramount Studio under my uncle Adolf Zucker, who had told me all during my growing up, when you're ready, come to the studio. And that was before I knew anything. So I went to college and I studied drama and I graduated magna cum laude and I was head of the Purple Mask Society, which was the drama society. And I had done stage design and I had studied playwriting with Marion Galloway, who had taught Tennessee Williams. And then I'd gone and fought through the Battle of the Bulge and been missing in action and come back and been in a play on Broadway and went to see my uncle because I wanted to get out of New York. And uh, he said, well, the head of the studio is here, Henry Ginsburg. <clears throat> so I'll call him and you can talk to him. So I went in and he said, what do you do, kid? I said, well, I'm an actor. He said, how do I know? I said, well, I just closed in a play. He said, well, that doesn't do me much good. What else do you do? I said, I'm a writer. He said, I don't read. And I, I didn't know what to say. So I went back to my uncle and I told him that. He said, well, he's in charge. So I never worked at Paramount until a lot later. Your first job actually came about, and maybe you sort of learned the lesson, or the person who was showing you the ropes had learned that lesson, and he sort of gilded the lily when it came to your resume. Joe Fields, yeah. Joe was part of a great family. His father was Lou Fields, who was half of Weber and Fields, which is a great Jewish comedy team. And his sister was Dorothy Fields, who wrote the lyrics for The Way You Look Tonight for so many of the Jerome Kern songs and other great composers, and a lot of what Fred Astaire made famous. And he had, there was another brother named Herbie, who was a producer. And Joe was a playwright. He did Junior Miss and My Sister Eileen and a number of, and a lovely man. He had the face of a, bloodhound, as many comedy writers do. They're the most tragic faces in the world. And uh, kind, sweet man. And so he, uh, when I was making the rounds in New York as an actor, he hired me as assistant stage manager and, and bit player for a play that he wrote called The French Touch. And uh, the night before the opening, it was the only play that René Clair, the great French uh, director, film director, did. He had a black suit with crimson pinstripes. Elegant man. And um, the, at the preview, because the producer also produced Charbert perfume, they filled all the air conditioners with Charbert and almost anesthetized <laughs> the cast. 
And I had never gone on in the lead, in the juvenile lead. I was hired as an understudy, too. I didn't know the lines. And they called me one night at dinner, and I was eating cauliflower. My mother handed me the phone. It was a stage manager, and he said, you've got to come down here because you're on tonight. And it was the night that they sprayed the theater. And I went tearing down in the subway. I think I probably swallowed that cauliflower about six <laughs> months ago. And this happened in 1946. And um, anyway, I got there, and it was one of those moments of concentration that you pray for, where because of the necessity of accomplishing a goal, you accomplish it. And I sat, I got dressed in the in the other actor's costume and put on a fake mustache and opened the script and learned it in half an hour, learned the juvenile lead in half an hour, and then knocked on the doors and told Brian Ahern to get on stage, you know, because it was half hour. And he said, well, what the hell are you doing? I said, I'm playing the juvenile lead. He said, good Lord, we'd better rehearse. <laughs> so he got Arlene Francis and everybody, and we were all rehearsing in, in whispers. And we got to the middle of it, and somebody said, Garbo's out there. <laughs> so the rehearsal was finished. <clears throat> we all raced to the curtain, and we're looking through the people. That's why the cauliflower sat. stuck so oh, long. Oh, boy. Garbo and perfume, and what a night. Mm. When, when you dreamed about going into films, was, was being a screenwriter the first love? Was that the role you always wanted to play? I didn't want to play it. I haven't liked playing it. I wish <laughs> I never had played it. Uh, I wanted to be an actor, but I didn't, you know, to be an actor, you have to be, you have to be so tough. And to keep the toughness that can let you withstand rejection, and at the same time to nurture the kind of sensibility and sensitivity that you need for the creative process is, uh, it's almost insupportable. It almost can't happen. And I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. You have to be awfully tough, though, to be a screenwriter, too, because you're involved in really an ensemble process. There are actors, director, producer. And very early on in your career, you had a couple of very, very tough lessons in what it meant to come into conflict with a, with a director. Share, a, if you will, a couple of the stories from the making of, of your first feature film in 1951, Teresa. Teresa. <laughs> Boy. Um, it, it's probably really typical because For a young writer, which I was, your whole skin is off. And you confuse what you write with who you are. And so any criticism of that, any doubt about it, is like a personal wound. And you bleed and resent and steam and boil and get furious and, and put a smile on top of it. Now, I've got this triangular smile, which is there even if I'm not smiling now, from having spent so many years pretending it didn't matter. And you have to do that. Um, you have to do it. You have to learn to do it. Because in order to protect a script, and I had to protect Teresa, it was directed by Fred Zinnemann, who is one of the most graceful and gifted directors in the world. From Here to Eternity, A Man for All Seasons, you can go through an endless list of remarkable films. And he is a man of, in, of superb integrity. Um, but this, he didn't understand the script. He didn't understand it. Uh, well, one of the reasons was that it was so very much about me. It was, I mean, that was another thing that was typical of it as a young person's script. It was, it was so personal, so autobiographical in so many ways, so confessional, which, by the way, I think is essential for screenwriters to be willing to do. Um, but he, he really didn't understand what I was doing. So in the re rewrite process, I literally had to write 
a new version of the screenplay which kept all the old lines but on one side I had the dialogue and opposite each line I had the subtext why the line was being said from the character's point of view so that he had a key to the behavior of these people but even that tended to disappear the night we began shooting in, in Italy and I still don't know what it was that got in the way. It happens with all of us where we cannot share somebody else's vision. But he, through his own magnanimity and the practical requirement of having to shoot a picture, said, look, you're a kid. You're 28 or whatever I was. He said, I'm 43 or 4 or whatever he was. He said, you work with these actors. You take them at night and rehearse them in the scene and explore the scene and I will take them the next morning and stage it. So what really was a difficulty turned out to be an enormous opportunity for me to work with actors that way. That's the positive side of it. I mean, the, the negative side was that he hired a, a writer to come in and rewrite the script without your knowledge, and you, you ran into some other yeah. rough yeah. moments, but you, but you kept going. And, and, I mean, that would be a point at which in the life of a young writer it would be very easy to get so discouraged. You just say, well, maybe this isn't what I want to do with my life, but you kept at it. Well, if we hadn't been in Italy, uh, I, I don't know if I could have stayed. He hired Bill Malden, who was the great World War II cartoonist, as technical advisor. And while I was working on part of the script, <coughs> Bill, without my knowing it, was writing, rewriting the Italian section. And because he had been in Italy and I hadn't, I'd fought in Germany. But I didn't use his script. I did use some of his ideas, which were absolutely wonderful and re-screenplayed those sequences. That was a, a rocky beginning, but one of the, uh, the most lasting relationships that you've had has been with another director, also well known as an actor, Paul Newman. What's, what's been the secret to that collaboration? I mean, is it a lack of conflict? No. Oh, no. <laughs> no. He, Better he, conflict? Uh, he calls me Baroque. He says, you're a Baroque writer. And... Uh, I say, well, you're linear. He says, well, I'm from Shaker Heights. He, um, I tend to be very florid with my emotion. Well, I, I catch myself on that monitor. And I'm, <laughs> I'm doing a lot of this. We like that when guests <laughs> do that. That's good. But Paul is, he's a minimalist. He never repeats an emotion. He never repeats a look. The only thing he repeats are terrible jokes, which he can't control himself over. And he'll even repeat the one you just told him as if he were telling it to you for the first time. So maybe it's a matter of opposites attracting. It really is. And we've been friends from since 1954, when people were coming up and saying, Mr. Brando, can I have your autograph? Because Paul had bigger lips in those days. And he looked more like Brando. It's hard to imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so he would happily sign Marlon Brando's name. He never signs his own autograph because the kids hate it when he does. It's now, that would now be considered a two for one. The name of Marlon Brando is written by Paul Newman. I know. One of the most enduring works that, that you created was Rebel Without a Cause. And were you surprised at what an enormous hit that became? I couldn't really look at the movie for a long time because of the anguish of, of the loss of Jimmy. James Dean. Um, it, it was a very strange time because the whole city was hit a belly, a belly blow. Even people who had ridiculed him. It was such a shock and especially somebody that young and that gifted snatched away with two pictures unreleased. And Warner Brothers, to their enormous credit, really hesitated about whether to release Rebel at all hmm. because they knew that they would be accused of sensationalism. Capitalizing. And, yeah. Right. And, but they did. They did go ahead with it. But I, I had seen it before Jimmy died at a sneak preview. 
And I was appalled by the picture because it was too long, it was slow, it was self-indulgent. And uh, I was very noisy about what I hated about it. And they did cut a lot and kind of shaped it down and made it less self-conscious. But I never saw the final print until just before the New York opening. I had gone to Jimmy's funeral and met the family and gone through a period of grief that I don't even understand myself because um, we weren't that close. But, um, and then I was destroyed by the movie. First of all, my parents were sitting next to me and it was about them as much as anything and, and about my relationship with them. And they didn't recognize those aspects of themselves on the screen, which is a great relief always because once somebody else is playing you, you tend not to see yourself. Um, but they've been an inspiration for a lot, both, uh, I mean, good memories and bad, but we are who we are. But the other thing was that it was so mixed up with Jimmy and my feeling about him that, um, that I, I would be destroyed every time I tried to look at the picture. The film remains a, a movie that you, I looked at it two weeks ago. And, and much of it remains true to today. Some of it is very much part of the 50s, the time in which it was made. But do you think that it lasts and, and continues to have that kind of power because of the, the themes are still so, uh, so fitting? Loneliness, a kind of lostness. I think it's even more than that. I think it's, it's people's need to feel worth something. People's need to feel good. Um, and I mean people's need to feel as if they're doing good works and as if they're being acknowledged for that. And understood. Understood. Um, when teachers set high standards, even, they're, they're, even if they're tough on kids, we now call it tough love. And people didn't understand that in those days. And I think that what happened in Rebel was that that a young man found that he could no longer blame parents for where he felt he was, that he could no longer wait for them to change if he was going to change. And instead of looking up to the parent for permission to grow, he began looking out and creating a family because our own uh, families no longer really served us. Nobody knew how to be a mother or father. We had to find our own families. And so this lateral reaching out began to happen where we could reaffirm each other. You see it in gangs today. Mm. And, and bad as the, or antisocial as the product of a gang may be, the impulse is about as sweet, it seems odd to say it, but it is. It's, it's to a belong. longing to belong. It's a longing for love. Monkeys don't, don't groom each other to get dander off their skin. They're, they groom each other to let each other know that they're there. Mm. And that's what, that's what I think that picture says. We're, we're down to, uh, to our last two minutes or so. The time is really flying. But I wanted to ask you, at, at some point, you decided to leave screenwriting, to leave Hollywood. You moved here to Seattle. Why? I didn't really leave screenwriting. I left the, the kind of screenwriting I had always done because my life began to catch up with my theme. And I was no longer writing from the kind of passion, the kind of quest, the kind of questioning that I had early on when I hadn't really solved and resolved a lot of my personal problems. So you, in, in essence you were getting happier and it took some of the jet fuel away from it your did. writing. It took some of it away and now I need to find themes that are less inside me and more out there. I mean there is so much to write about, so much that has to be said. It's just that we can't find so many happy third acts now that have much conviction. But the other thing is that I'm very, very involved at the zoo and I have found my heaven, <laughs> the Woodland Park Zoo. I'm a docent. I observe <laughs> the gorillas. I do night observation on the elephants. I take kids around. 
I stand by the poison dart frogs in the rainforest and explain what they do. And it's a great way to feel that you're having some tiny impact on the planet. And I'm sure there's a play in there somewhere. I'm sure. I want to thank you for being a guest on Upon Reflection, Stuart Stern. Thank you. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org classics.